recording in progress. Oh, I don't know why I started recording and I immediately mute myself. <laughs> okay. So, okay, we start with product types. I guess. So the, these two chapters, we talk about product types and some types. And for product type, we first have binary products, which are just pairs of values. It's also ordered. I don't even know if there are any language support like unordered pair or unordered tuple, those kind of things. Uh, the associated elimination forms are projections which is not commonly used term, but it's used in this book. Also the nullary product, they use, they use the nullary product like a, a tuple of nothing as null, as, as, as unit basically. So you know where the name unit comes from? Uh, unit? Yeah, so it just means that there's only one value that has that type. That's yeah, it. yeah. Where it's unit, it means one. <clears throat> and I think projections is actually a common term, but in, in like uh, it's kind of the same thing as in uh, like uh, if you think of like a lot of times I call these pairs like uh, Cartesian. Uh, Paris, right? And uh, you can think of it as a two-dimensional thing, right? Like, oh, I see. So the one thing on the bottom is the first thing in the pair, and the thing, I mean, the x axis is the first thing, and the y axis is the uh, the second thing, right? Or you know, however many dimensions. And so, like, projecting means, you know, taking a two-dimensional thing and turning it into a one-dimensional thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah the things that define ordered pairs in category theory, you know, if, if, a fun, if, if an, some object has arrows with the appropriate commuting relationships, then which are called projections, then it's, a, you know, it's a product. So product type has both a lazy and eager dynamics. So we have still like for everything from that to uh, functions to now product type, we have different semantics that we need to choose. It's like different design space of the programming languages. For the lazy dynamics up here can be a value even where the components are not value. So they will not be evaluated until they are accessed. And with the eager dynamics, a pair can only be valued if all of these components are values. So most, most languages are like easy, eager dynamics, but yeah, there are exceptions like Haskell. <laughs> And then they generalize this concept of binary product into finite product, where it's, it is indexed by a finite set of indices. And then the operation is I index projection. And also labeled tuples or records indexed by symbols rather than indices. But I don't think they actually talk about that, but in the chapters, I, but I guess it's just a straightforward extension from the tuple. So I guess the thing about records is they're, they are actually unordered, right? Like when you define it, you see you say an order, but it's not like when you construct it or project it, it's not, it's not ordered. 
I don't know. I think it's pretty. It's pretty much ordered, like <laughs> at least in the in, because this they also have ML background, so I assume that's what they also talked about. Mm -hmm. Like in ML, you if I record like two field, if you exchange them, it's not the same record. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess in languages with nominal types, it's a little bit different. Like in, in Rust, for example, a struct, you can, like, the compiler can do magic with it. But for here, the record is not nominal type. It's still like a structural type. So mm -hmm. you can't switch field. But like when you do the constructor, right? Do you like if you? I don't. I don't know about ML, but in Haskell, right? You can. If you do the curly yeah, braces, I guess, yeah, this is. This you can is put them in difference. any order. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it's still a product. Yeah. I guess. Uh, I guess this is more like syntactic sugar. Mm -hmm. But yeah. also right. Haskell is pure, though, so you don't need to worry about the side effects of different argument mm -hmm. passed to the constructor. I mean, I guess it only really I, matters if you're in like C or something and you can take a pointer to one of the fields and uh, then you actually care what the order is. Yeah, all, all side effect, consider you pass several arguments, but they are some expression you need to evaluate. And if <coughs> the order is different, so what is semantic of that? Who to evaluate first? Sorry, I, I like I slow everything down. <laughs> it's it's fine. Like I, I I think Connor, so he's the actual organizer of this meetup. He said before that that's the best part of this meetup is just discussions. Otherwise, it's just boring yeah. reading books, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're good. Yeah. So, yeah, we have this semantics where we just add the unit type and the product type. In here is a product, binary product. And we actually add the uh, expression for them. Where for the unit type, we, I guess we just give it a different name called trivial, but uh, usually in the concrete syntax, we write uh, like empty pair of parentheses, which is common in a lot of programming languages. And we also have pair and projection left and projection right. There is no elimination form for the unit type uh, because it's already a value. So el elimination is like you get a value from the structure. I think that's probably a, not a good explanation, but <laughs> Elimination is extracting something, and the the trivial is our their value. The static is pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, the product types type is is a product is a product of the type of the two expressions. But uh, we also need to reverse the rule, so we have another two inference rules. Also, the product of this trivial value is just unit. Um, nothing special. Dynamics of product type for well, trivial is just like that. Well, this is also not surprising. Like if the if I have two values. And then the pair is also a value. And those two rules here is eager. And it basically says 
that we we will if we have a pair, we will just immediately evaluate its left hand side and right hand side and left hand side first and then right hand side. And yeah, the bracket rules and the premises are omitted for a lazy dynamic. So for lazy, we just don't have those two rules. And, and we only, we only uh, do evaluation of E1 and E2 when we access it. So at that time, we force to have a value of it. And those two rules are not surprising. If we need to access uh, part of a uh, pair, we need to ex we need to first evaluate it. And if both part of the pair is a value, we can access the left and right. I guess it's still a little bit surprising because I can imagine a semantics where you can, if it's lazy and then you can access the left-hand side without caring what right-hand side actually is, but that's not this semantic. I think it is actually, but um, it's just saying so the, you have yeah. to actually create a, a pair before you can apply a projection to it even if the two values inside the pair aren't known. That's what the 10, 2, E, and F are saying. Before you can apply a projection, you have to actually have a, a pair or a tuple. Oh, I see. The bracket rules and promises are omitted for lazy dynamics. So, so right. even those two premises are omitted yep. if it's lazy. Yeah, that's what got me confused. So yeah, that makes sense. The type safety is still just the progression and preservance. Just uh, we need to prove that. Preservation, sorry. And again, just proof by induction. And since we are programmers, we don't care about proofs. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do care about your, your type system, is right? Yeah, I guess even we do proof, we want to find some automatic solution for those kind of things. We don't want to do it manually. It's too error prone and boring. I oh, guess I boring and error prone are usually together. Do it in cock and have the system guide you through the proof. Yeah. And then this finite product is just an extension for binary product. And now we don't even need a unit type because finite can be just zero. And then we just have a product, we have a tuple and then a projection. This is just concrete syntax. I guess nothing yeah. surprising here. It's everything just are generalizations. So that funny arrow that he keeps using. Yeah, I guess it's still kind of pattern matching syntax. Yeah, it seems to be like what would usually be written is uh, an arrow with a bar at the end, like a mapping for a value to a whatever it maps to. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's usually we don't write indices because it's implicit, like just zero, one, two, something. Yeah. But the arrow, the arrow with the hook, I was, was looking it up, usually means an injection, but the, it doesn't make sense in this, unless you know, I suppose you might be abstracting over the. Yeah, I've just yeah. been reading it as like replaced by. Yeah, because it's definitely yeah, it's definitely not injection. That's not the meaning. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess it's their book, so you can define whatever <laughs> syntax perfect. you want. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so is that the first place they use that, or did it, did you use it earlier? Yeah, it's earlier as well. It was in the last uh, pair of chapters. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah this is not surprising we have promised have all the all the expressions have a type and then we can just create a product type similarly Like this, I guess the only thing that I can, we can talk a little bit about is that all those all those expressions types are independent. So, in certain program languages, we can say the the second field type depends on the first field type. We can't do that here. Hmm. And the dynamic should all be the same. Just depend on lazy or eager. Basically, the bracket part means eager. If it's lazy, we just get rid of that. This is really long, but basically this is we will to like evaluate the tuple will evaluate its each argument in turn, well, not argument, it's each, what's the word, wait. Element, each, each uh, member. Yeah, each member, uh, each components, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's funny, it took me a little while to understand the comment in the next paragraph, but, but um... I guess the... And yeah, to access to access a component, we need to first make it a value. Mm -hmm. And then here is a lazy eager distinction to to access a component. We don't need to in the lazy version. We don't need to make the whole uh, tuple a value, but in eager version, we do. And then the safety version, safety is the same. And with product type, we can, uh, now we can bundle multiple things together. So we can like simplify the prim primitive recursion construct of T that we talk about in, in Chapter nine, a little bit, where we can just use this iter rather than rack. Where, where instead of like evaluate into a single thing, we always evaluate into appear basically where the where the left hand side is what we we carry the L. the left one's like the index the integer 
yeah, yeah. you're inducting on. Yeah, the integer, but I'm just thinking about what, what this integer is as the natural it, number. It's, it, it's the same thing because X prime is just the previous step, right? And then you take the left of it. So that's oh, a new, yeah, a new successor. The, yeah. It's the same thing as the Y here. You can use product type to implement mutual primitive recursion. We have two functions simultaneously by primitive recursion. That's, that's pretty cool. Mm. We just make an auxiliary function. E, e o where it compute the uh, both results simultaneously by swapping back and forth. Yeah, that's that's a nice trick. Mm. Kind of similar to like Fibonacci number, how we do this kind of stuff, I guess. Yeah, it seems like that dynamics, the order of left versus right would affect the computation of this then though, right? Yeah. yeah. Also seems kind of broken if uh, like one of the, uh, I guess if we're still doing total languages, right? So yeah, if it's not total, then it's, you don't want to always evaluate both. But, yeah. yeah. Okay, no product types are the most basic form of structured data. All languages have some form of product type, but yeah, often in a form that combine with other concepts. Usually like function with multiple arguments and multiple return, multiple results can be, can be actually seen as functions taking a tuple or returns a tuple, even though those languages usually don't call it this way and have separate tuple. Uh, yeah, objects. Represent as tuples of mutually uh, recursive functions. Not exactly sure about this part. Yeah, that seems interesting <laughs> definition of object. Yeah. Also, struct is like just in imperative language where components are mutable. And there are many papers on uh, finite product types, which include record types as a special case. Also, record type can have subtyping, but I, I guess for sub subtyping, it's like additional semantics you need to add. Not all languages do that by default. Like I know Elm does that. Elm also TypeScript, I guess TypeScript interface is like that. Yeah, right, so Elm's record is like a row has row polymorphism, like a large record, a record ABC can be passed as a record AB, something like that. I think I actually tested that and it's not, it doesn't actually work, but that was a while in, back in Elm. In Elm? 
Mm -hmm. I, I use it a lot. So oh, you do okay. Yeah, I was trying yeah. to do like object oriented programming and uh it's it's not OOP. It's yeah. Oh, I guess it is. It's but it's very different from OOP in most languages. But yeah, in the I, I guess this is a must for web programming, at least that's what I find. I also because use when I use TypeScript, it's also something come up a lot. It's we need to pass a larger object into a function that accepts a narrower interface. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, I think I get how the objects represented as tuples with a mutual recursive functions, because you could pretend that the object you're inducting or you're doing recursion on like the object state, I guess. And you're always passing the object and then. And that's how you're mutating the object through the. Yeah, like, magic so I, calls. I think like. If you think of a uh, object as like it's like it's normal members and then and the and also all of the methods are like part of the product, right? Um, and then like you can have like a let rec uh, expression before you create the, the the record. And in that let rec, those those functions can call each other. So I think that's why it means uh, mutually recursive functions that and that and then end up being members of the product or the record at the end. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, not exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think there, there are different way to use closure to mimic object. I I thought about it before, but it, it's just it really, I think too closely about it. And uh, yeah, it's hard to get. If you're trying to do something like C++ with all of the inheritance and virtual base classes and all that stuff, then it it, it doesn't really work. But um, it's pretty difficult. Okay, then then we go to the chapter eleven. Some types. So yeah, some types. I guess in this group, everyone knows what some types is. So we don't need to say too much. First, we have binary sum and also nullary sum which is nothing. And then we generalize them into finite sum. And yeah, not with sum is void. We, uh, you can see it has a eliminator, but no constructor because we basically can't create void. And also a binary sum. And then for the binary sum, we have two constructors. We create a binary sum that is left or right. And, and then also we can do like pattern matching on them. Yeah, the static statics of some types have those following rules. Like if the expression is void, then the eliminator can be it's just tau, which means everything. I guess this is how the void type is used in certain languages like Haskell. It's, 
also Scala has this kind of bottom type of it can be everything basically I think this is how it used yeah I think that it's a, I don't know if it's the same but uh, yeah, it's basically it's escape escape hatch of the type system basically I don't care here. so it's like uh it's kind of represents uh like if you're doing um theorem proving right it void sort of represents something that can't be uh proven right so it's kind of like yeah. false and it's like if you can prove this thing that can't be proven then you can prove anything else so if you can give me a type a value of type void then i then i can give you back a value of any type um yeah but you, yeah, you can never make a type and you can never make a value of type void yeah because there's, there's no constructors for it yeah, it's something the type system just comes to deal with. For example, a function that never returns it immediately exits a program, something like that. Well, you can write you can write a, a, a function that takes a void as a parameter, but you just can never call it. Yeah. And, and uh, anyway, yeah. Yeah, there are a bunch of use cases for that. And those rules are pretty straightforward. Basically, if E is tau one, then when we we know at least the left hand side of this sum type is tau one. For the tau two, is like we need to explicitly provide what that type is similar for this one. And for this one, E is tau one plus tau two. And and then under the condition, under additional condition that x will is tau and we get e when is tau, similar for this branch. Uh, yeah, this is basically pattern matching is like e when and e2 need to have the same type. And the dynamics is this is just void. We don't even need to care about this. Uh, again, there are eager and lazy stuff. We for the lazy version when we construct the sum type, we don't need to have a value. But for eager version, we do. Also, for the eager version, yeah, for the eager version, we need to first evaluate the expression. For both cases, if we need to do pattern matching, we need to actually have a value with no. So we have this promise. And when we actually have a value, when we do pattern matching, we just can just do substitution. And yeah, we can prove the type safety stuff.
And yeah, the sum type can be generalized into these finite sums. It's the same as generalizing product type. And yeah, it's it's all the all the same stuff. So nothing surprising. And I guess this is the place that where he started to talk about some. Uh, discussions first, like talk about the void in a lot of programming languages like C++ or Java is a misnomer. It should be, it is unit, it's, except it doesn't have a constructor, but it's still unit, not void. Uh, And for the booleans, booleans can be seen as the sum type. We it basically have true and false. Also, this if syntax can be seen as pattern matching of on boolean. And then the statics and dynamics won't be that surprising. So it's interesting this book like uh, is very disciplined. It talks about some type and then talk about Boolean because usually I guess in undergrad course, we will teach Booleans and maybe never touch some types. Yeah, yeah, and they talk about how the Boolean can be defined in terms of binary sums and nullary products. Which is interesting that they use unit to define something that is not unit, but anyway. So I, after this is over, I'd like to talk about why this all makes sense. Like uh, what, what algebraic types are. I have a little code example. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. And yeah, in, um, Enums are enums of some types. It's the same, same kind of things. Options, another like kind of ubiquitous type. Where we have optional, we have two kind of values, and we can do again the eliminator is like we do pattern matching on that. If it's now we do something, otherwise we do something else. And option type is also definable in terms of sum and nullary product. Kind of, yeah. 
This actually, you usually, all option types is implemented. But I guess in, yeah, it's usually how option type is implemented anyway. Usually like language, languages don't have a special option type. It, it is just some and an array product. Also, no pointer fallacy. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's like a lot of languages have this concept called null. And like every type, every type become is either something or null. And so if you have null value, you don't, don't even know what type it is. <laughs> and yeah, basically, basically the book says it's bad, and I agree. Except yep. in dynamic type languages, where it's almost impossible to avoid now, though. So what? I, so yeah, I was wondering because like he's he says the first error is to deem values of a certain types to be mysterious entities called pointers, but like yeah. pointers have practical use like for performance reasons. So like, what is the suggestion to use instead? Huh. Well, you can make an abstraction of pointers, right? And the uh, abstraction of The pointer uh, itself like is an abstraction. Pointer is the abstraction of address. So yeah, like machines I mean, don't know anything about pointers. It's in those address, so. Yeah, that's well, that's it like is, uh, okay, conflate, if you conflate pointers with addresses on the machine, right? But they're more like, uh, indexes into an array, right? And yeah. uh, if and on a machine, it just happens that the array is all of the memory in the in your process or whatever, and your pointer is an index into all of the memory in your process. And they, so, it, you can totally represent that as a a purely functional thing. Yeah, and also I think <laughs> well, in here they talk about pointers, but I think I think you know, this no pointer policy also like it it is ubiquitous it is everywhere like in languages like java we don't talk about pointer we talk about references but it's still the same so it can be different abstraction but it have the same kind of property it doesn't even need to be a machine pointer it can be like ref reference content but still it will have the same kind of property Yeah, I guess I'm I'm not so concerned about the no pointer part. I'm just that one sentence about mysterious entities called pointers and doesn't really suggest <laughs> yeah. a, a solution or it doesn't give a solution to that. Or I mean like this optional type is not really a solution for that. Uh I I think it is. Well, uh, it's like you can I think the optional is separate from pointers, right? And uh yeah. And like you can have an option of a pointer or something that's that has both uh, semantics. So, are you familiar yeah. with Haskell at all? Haskell, like they have this uh, PTR point, like a, it's a value that represents a pointer into memory. And I, I didn't know that. No. Yeah, like. Pointer is certainly a very useful abstraction, though. Like even even Rust, like mm -hmm. if if un the unsafe Rust has pointers because it is useful. Yeah, but, I mean, if you're going to yeah. do anything at a machine level, you that's you have to use pointers somehow. Yeah. Uh, doesn't 11.10 just seem that even though it's an option, 
if the option's empty, you're still going to get an error. What? He, he seems to be making Let's, a distinction between the which Boolean one? test Eleven, and ten. It's just yeah. a that's a case statement, right? It's saying if it's null, then return the value e error. It's not necessarily an error. It's just a different value. It's like an if statement, right? If it's null, then do okay. e error. Otherwise, do e okay. It's just it's just like for options, we need to actually unwrap that to use it. And if everything can be now, we need to do extensive null checks. That's one thing. Another thing is that it will be a runtime error. Yeah, if, if we are talking about level of actually machine addresses, then it can be a lot more dangerous than now because now it's immediate crash. But in like C++ or unsafe Rust, you can have dangling pointers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Data bounds over right yeah. the stack. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. So yeah, th this is not talking about machine level pointers. It's just talk about the general idea. I think if they call it references, it's, it is like more understandable because most languages have these policies uh, call, call it references. Mm -hmm. I think that isn't the, what's the difference? So I, I, in functional languages, there's a different meaning for reference versus imperative languages, right? And in, I think imperative language like C++, a reference is, it's like, you can't do pointer arithmetic on it, even though it's a pointer versus a pointer. C++ reference is really weird. So yeah. it's a very special meaning. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess also like different languages, have the ad hoc meaning for references. Mm -hmm. I think in, in usually in like uh, functional languages and in type theory in general, like a reference is sort of uh, a pointer to a, a, some memory in the heap, right? And, yeah, uh, and you can have, but and, then you need to define what a pointer is. So. Well, it's just me, it's, a, it's like, it's just, of some value that represents a memory in a heap that you can that you can change, right? Um, and so it's not really a pointer. But. It, I guess it's like in the language semantics, usually the concept reference, not in all languages anyway, like in certain languages, reference is explicit, but in a lot of languages in the semantics, reference just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It, it is a runtime artifact, so. Yeah. yeah, like in Java and C Sharp and all those languages and like they call it a reference, but it's really a pointer and it, you just can't do pointer arithmetic on it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's a, that's also, it's a runtime, at a runtime it's just an address, but it's in the semantics, in the semantics we, just say certain types of reference types, they behave differently, but we don't actually say what reference is, except they behave differently. Yeah. Okay, I guess we are done with those two chapters. And uh, you still want recording for the demonstration? Uh, not really, but if you want to, that's fine. No, I can stop that. It's up to you. Okay. 